Hi, I'm Natalie Roy, and today I'll be presenting All STEM Leads to Rome, Teaching the Classical World Through Engineering and Experimental Archaeology. If you'd like to follow along with my presentation today, please scan the QR code that you see here on the screen. I'll give you a moment to do that. For two and a half decades, I taught at an elite private school in my city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where curricular resources were vast. When STEM became the rage in education in the early 2000 teens, my school was quick to hire a STEM coordinator whose job it was to assist core teachers in integrating STEM into their classes. Riding on this wave of STEM excitement at my school, I proposed an upper level STEM integration course called Roman Technology in which my students would read Latin texts which covered STEM topics, such as Vitruvius's De Architectura and Pliny's Historia Naturalis, and then employ experimental archaeology techniques to recreate the products and processes we read about. The school's STEM coordinator was thrilled to help me, and I developed an amazing course in which we mixed and set concrete, plotted an anilomatic sundial, and recreated hairstyles, cooked Roman food, built Roman musical instruments, etc., etc. It was a smashing success in that students outside my Latin program were asking for me to offer the course for non Latin students. Unfortunately, that was not to be. That spring, I found out that the headmaster of the school had decided to phase out our decades old Latin program and wanted me to transition into a technology facilitator role. I quickly found another job teaching middle school Latin at a large local public school. Since the principal wanted to expand the school's offerings of elective classes, she asked if I might be able to adapt the Roman technology class to include non Latin students and if I might teach a class on classical mythology. As you can probably guess, I accepted the job, and I am now in my sixth year of teaching both the Latin technology class, the Roman technology class, and the other one, which I called Myth Makers. This mythology class is a steam maker lab class in which we use the stories of classical myth to inspire maker projects. STEAM, STEM's close cousin, adds the A to represent art in the acronym. And that was five years ago, and these two classes are now some of the most popular offerings at the school. To give you an idea of my curriculum, I'll discuss two of our smaller projects and one large project in greater detail. I'll also elaborate on how I incorporate STEM methodology. But before I do that, let me clarify what it means to teach STEM. STEM in K-12 education is more of a methodology than a collection of subjects. It's not just teaching science, technology, engineering, and math, but using those subject areas to spark creative and critical thinking, as well as collaborative skills in the service of a design challenge. It's very much a way of thinking and learning rather than just instruction in the subjects which the acronym stands for. Some STEM teachers are even more exclusive in categorizing STEM. All of the subject areas have to be represented and the challenge or problem has to have more than one solution. Others are less restrictive, but still, it's worth noting that what STEM teachers consider STEM is not always what the general public thinks of as STEM per se. So now we'll discuss a very popular STEM challenge from my Roman technology class, catapults. Since weapons, even replicas, are not allowed on our campus, we focus on many models and the concepts which make Roman catapults so effective. We start the unit with a short lecture on the history and development of catapults in the Mediterranean world, focusing on the material remains, such as catapult shot at Masada and the images of catapults on Trajan's column. Throughout the lecture, students are asked to read short articles and watch videos of replicas in action, including a passage by Josephus on their violent effects on those being attacked. The students also read selections in translation from Vitruvius's book 10 of De Architectura about the weight, size, and aerodynamic qualities of different projectiles and the construction of a scorpion, 
Vitruvius himself was a scorpion operator in the Roman army of the first century BCE. Next, the students learned to build three mini models out of simple materials, such as tongue depressors, rubber bands, and bottle caps. After each build, students must test their catapult's performance in three challenges. Number one, distance. The students shoot their catapults as far as possible, measure and record data with each different projectile, cotton ball, ping pong ball, and a small rock. Number two, accuracy. The students have to shoot the projectile into a bowl and record data. And three, tower. The students have to record how many shots they fire to knock down a large um, tower made of paper cups. In each of the challenges, there's a variable and a constant for the students to take note of. In the next step of the unit, students use the information they learned in these initial challenges to construct their own catapult, constrained by the supplies they're given. Students whose catapults perform best are asked to model their shots and explain why they think they worked so well. Likewise, students whose models flop must reflect on why they failed and, allowed, and are allowed to tweak their models for better performance and try again. Surely the Romans worked in the same way. The second unit I'd like to share is from my Mythmakers course, focused on mythological stories that reference sea travel, such as Jason and the Argonauts or Homer's Odyssey. Students design and build a cardboard boat that can stay afloat while it holds a half pound of weight. And they must sail this ship across a small swimming pool powered only by their breath. They must sail the ship across the thing and so caught and they're as they're caught on their on this and the wind is their breath. <laughs> Following the engineering design process, the students first learn a little about ancient seafaring, the life of sailors, ships, and buoyancy to help them ask and imagine how ships worked. Then, after exploring the supplies and hearing the constraints for the project, they plan and create their own ships from cardboard, masking tape, and recycled cloth. Through the process, they test their ships, improve them, and then share their designs by sailing them in the small swimming pool. It's always fun to see what my young students are able to build. <laughs> Models are fun and they teach students how to work with building supplies, think creatively, and work collaboratively. But experimental archeology span gives students a deeper appreciation for ancient engineering, tool use, and the real life experience of ancient daily life. Every time I teach Roman technology, I commit to doing a large collaborative project in which I lead the students in building something real. In our first year, we built a 20 foot anilomatic sundial that uses the viewer's shadow to tell the time. In our next year, the students worked in small teams to build brick pottery kilns and fire their own voted body parts. This year's past endeavor, this past year's endeavor was the Roman Road Project, the largest we've ever attempted. So I'll talk about that now. Through the middle of our 1955 school campus runs a large grassy area that generally floods when it rains. My classroom looks out over this area where in 2020, right before the pandemic shutdowns, my Roman technology class watched a student trying to traverse this stretch of soggy grass. He was unsuccessful in doing so without getting his shoes completely wet. Despite this problem, many students continued to use this pathway due to the fact that our school's halls are old and too small for our students. It was originally built as an elementary school for much smaller uh, children. My Roman technologist laughed at the soggy shoed student and jokingly said that a Roman road would probably help the situation since they were elevated and kept water off of them. Eureka, an idea was born we would build a functioning sidewalk in the style of an ancient Roman road. Fast forward to 18 months later, and I applied for and secured a grant from a local bank for the Roman road project. Working alongside our local department of transportation and development, my 78 Roman technology students studied many aspects of Roman road construction. We learned to pace the, the space like Roman land surveyors would have done to measure and order needed supplies. 
We surveyed the land and marked a straight course for the Roman road using gromas, ancient surveying tools. We hauled 42 tons of stone in buckets to simulate the experience of Roman road building soldiers seen on Trajan's column. We learned to mix concrete too. Although our intention was to erect milestones, we ran out of funding and decided to decorate and lay stones instead to approximate the experience. The project took two months and was not without setbacks. On the day before Mardi Gras break, as we had finished our concrete pour, someone rode a bike through the wet concrete of our road, leaving behind deep ruts that were unfixable. We had long discussions about what to do, finally deciding to fill the ruts with metal colored resin to simulate how the Romans used iron to fix ancient roads in Pompeii and ancient Britain. Although upsetting at first, this incident surely mimicked the life of ancient Roman road builders and engineers that solved multiple problems at every turn. The best part of the project was our collaboration with the local Department of Transportation and Development, or DOTD. Dr. Tyson Rupnow, Associate Director of the Transportation and Research Center, the research arm of DOTD, personally advised us on the project, giving many lectures on modern and ancient civil engineering, and obtained supplies for the project, such as gravel and concrete. <clears throat> Tyson was able to work with us so closely because it's actually part of his job description. DOTD gives free advice on road building projects to anyone in the state. This project became his pet because according to him, Roman roads are mythologized within preparation programs for civil engineers. Thus he regularly hosted civil engineers and construction professors on our campus to view the project, which they viewed with extreme interest and almost envy. The most interesting part of the project, in my opinion, was learning to use the Roman groma. Having read extensively about these and consulting with Dr. Courtney and Roby of Cornell University, whose classes use them for a hands-on surveying project, I was able to guide a woodworking expert in building a couple of the devices. The most difficult part of using a groma is wind blowing the lines out of alignment and making it nearly impossible to sight. But fear not, we used an ancient Roman trick. We placed small dishes of olive oil under the plumb bobs to stabilize their sway in the wind. Both Dr. Rupnow and I were both skeptical about this plan, but it worked like a charm, and it definitely made us consider the lives of ancient surveyors and road builders. To get the oil at just the right level under the plumb bobs, we used various pieces of scrap wood to hold up a small pedestal for the oil container. Would a surveyor have had to carry all these things around? How would that exactly have worked? Did he have a pack animal to assist him? In fact, we had lots of questions. The whole project left us wondering about many aspects of daily life for soldiers who bore most of the burden of building roads. Our biggest question was about foot, footwear. We wore rubber boots for the entirety of our project to protect us from the massive amount of mud we created and excavated as we built. How did Roman road builders protect their feet from the mud that surely had to have happened with road building? Side note, we plan to take up this topic during our next big Roman technology experimental archeology span project as we try to design and build our own Roman shoes. Even as the project began to wind down, the students continued to dream big and asked for a ribbon cutting ceremony. Thanks to my principal and the DOTD, we were able to pull together a short little ceremony with handmade golden laurel wreaths and cake. We invited the media and the local newspaper featured the project in a front page story. A month later, I got an excited text from a Latin teacher friend in the same city who told me that her minister was talking about our Roman road project in her sermon that Sunday morning. A couple of months later, I attended a lecture on Roman soldier reenactment at Tulane University by a Latin professor from North Carolina. When I asked, when I raised my hand to ask a question, I introduced myself as a teacher of Roman technology. The speaker stopped me and asked if we were the ones who had built that Roman road. Hopefully, we'll continue to spread the word that STEM and classics can indeed work together. As I finish up my story, let me ask you a question. Do you expect all of your students to become Latin or Greek teachers? 
It's sometimes hard for classics teachers to accept, but y'all, not every one of our students is going to make our dreams come true. They are going to be something though, and why not spark their interest in a STEM-related field while still teaching them the classics? American STEM fields, including civil engineering programs, are having trouble recruiting students, as is the STEM workforce. Instead of viewing STEM as our competitor, we classics teachers should be looking for ways to incorporate this popular and important pedagogy into classics. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.